All right, so welcome to the 1.30 show of this year's Senior Capstone Symposium, brought to you by Alyssa Withrow. And her presentation is about the degradation and marginalization of Tanzan Tanzanian marine environments. So without further ado, give it up for Alyssa. Thank you for that introduction, Hunter. Thank you all for attending my capstone presentation. Um, my capstone project focuses on Tanzania to explore how blast fishing and seaweed harvesting have um, contributed to coral reef degradation, economic marginalization of the people most directly involved in these practices, and the establishment of marine protected areas as possible solutions to such degradation and marginalization. I chose to focus on blast fishing and seaweed farming because um, marginalization of local people has led to a perpetuating system of degradation, and these are two examples of what can and is happening when the system has failed. I began scuba diving when I was 13, and as I got older and my diving became more sporadic, I began to notice that we have some serious problems with our oceans. The vibrant coral reefs that I once admired had transformed into new ecosystems of white coral and algae. I was fascinated and terrified to learn what was happening beneath the ocean surface. Two years ago, I met with Dr. Kaufman, and she told me about people throwing dynamite on coral reefs for fishing in Tanzania, and I was in disbelief. I wanted to understand why this destructive fishing practice was used and what had been the consequences thus far. I spent the summer of 2017 traveling throughout Tanzania and conducting research, including interviewing people about blast fishing and seaweed farming. Through my studies and travels, with the help of a political ecology lens, I began to peel back the layers of the inherently complex issues of ocean degradation and environmental governance within Tanzania. Tanzania is located on the eastern coast of Africa. From these figures, figures you can see that many of the major watersheds drain into the Indian Ocean. Because of Tanzania's coastal and lake areas, much of the country's population depends upon aquatic infrastructure and fishing as their main economic resources. However, 90% of the coral reefs located along the continental shores of the Indian Ocean are threatened by degradation and climate change. This map shows the population distribution within Tanzania. As you can see from the map, many of the most densely populated areas are located near the coastal zones or 100 kilometers from the coastline. There are about, five million, or there are about 8 million Tanzanians living in the five coastal regions. Political ecology is a guiding framework that I use to analyze human environment interactions within Tanzania and their implications in regard to Tanzanian marine environments. Opposing an apolitical approach that often overlooks key interactions and relationships, a political, uh, a political ecology framework incorporates systems thinking to provide a deeper understanding of environmental issues. In Paul Robbins' book, Political Ecology, he uses five main theses to analyze different various human environment interactions. While many of these theses can be applied to Tanzanian marine environments, the thesis that I most specifically apply to my analysis is that of degradation and marginalization. Later in the presentation, I will discuss environmental conflict and conservation and control theses as they relate to marine protected areas. The degradation of Tanzanian marine environments, and in particular coral reefs, as a result of seaweed farming and fishing with dynamite, have resulted in and from the marginalization of local stakeholders. These local stakeholders rely on marine environments for subsistence and revenue through fishing, tourism, and cash cropping, as well as their ecosystem services, such as coastal protection from storms and erosion, habitat for spawning, and nursery grounds for fish species. As you can see, coral reef environments um, are de being demanded from many different actors. Sorry. Um, state development intervention and global market demands have further stressed local stakeholders, resulting in riskier behaviors. Many of the local stakeholders engaging in degrading practices do not have the means to change those practices due to the unsustainable system in which they are engaged. Tanzania's coastal waters are heavily fished, and international fish species fleets international fleets take many fish species. With overfishing in combination with environmental degradation at an all-time high, there are fewer fish for local fishermen to compete for, as well as less means to compete with international commercial fleets. Subsistence fishermen in local communities are marginalized as they are outcompeted by governments and industrial fishing sectors. These unequal opportunities are profitable for investors, but they reduce fishery productivity, economic gains, and fish supply, leading to diminished food security among resource-dependent communities. The well-being of Tanzania's people is tied to the well-being of their coastal resources, yet Tanzania is one of the few remaining countries in which fishing using explosives still occurs on a large scale. 
Blast fishing, also known as dynamite fishing, is the illegal practice of killing a school of fish by blasting dynamite. Blast fishing is centered largely around urban areas such as Dar es Salaam due to its ease of availability of explosives and other ne necessary components, um, sufficient manpower and fuel, proximity from markets to sell the fish, and demand from consumers. One bomb might cost less than eight US dollars, while one blast could yield a catch of, of 100 to 400 kilograms of fish. With fish prices at two to three US dollars per kilogram, a dynamiter could profit anywhere from what? $400 to $1,800 per blast. These bombs work by rupturing the swim bladders of fish, causing them to become more buoyant and float to the surface, where they are collected um, by the fishermen. In some cases, scuba equipment is used to swim to the bottom and net up the fish that did not float. In addition to the, there are many other organisms killed in the blast aside from the desired fish, and the reef is reduced to rubble. In some cases, this rubble is collected and used as building materials. The amount of damage caused by a blast depends, varies depending upon the depth of the water, the type of explosive use, the depths at which it explodes, and the underlying habitats. Blast fishing in Tanzania has been practiced since the 1960s, became illegal in 1970, and continues to be practiced today. Blasts can be heard as frequently as 20 to 50 times a day in affected areas. There have been many efforts made by NGOs, religious groups, and nonprofits or NGOs, religious groups, and the government to stop blast fishing. However, without constant regulations, patrols, and funding, blast fishing continues to be practiced today. As human populations and demand for fish increases in Tanzania, the amount of fish being caught by subsistence fishermen is decreasing. Not only are yields per capita decreasing, but yields in the fishing industry as a whole are decreasing due to overfishing and as climate change disrupts fish distributions. The introduction of seaweed farming to Zanzibar in 1989 created an interesting shift in, divi the, in gender divisions of labor within the country. As fishermen returned to port with fewer and or smaller fish, women who would usually earn an income by buying fish, um, buying fresh catch and selling it at market are no longer making a livable wage. Seaweed farming was idealized as a, as a way for women to support themselves so that they would not have to rely on their husbands for household income. While at first glance, seaweed farming might seem like a great way for women to earn a profit by growing and selling seaweed um, to provide for a global demand in cosmetics and other luxury goods, it is more complex than it appears. All too often, agricultural and aquacultural cash crop production brings little benefit to produ producers or national economies, while enormous profits are earned by multinational corporations with increasing monopolistic control over markets. Seaweed is harvested for its high carrageenan and content, a polysaccharide derived from its cell walls used in pharmaceuticals, foods, and cosmetics as a gelling, thickening, and emulsifying agent. The techniques for seaweed farming in Tanzania were adopted from those used in the Philippines. As seen in the photo on the screen, um, the method of farming uses a tie-tie system whereby fronds of seaweed are stretched between wooden pegs. In many cases, these wooden pegs are made from mangrove trees. The price paid to seaweed farmers in Tanzania is as low as nine cents per kilogram. However, a corporation such as FMC Biopolymer deals with products such as Agros that sold for as much as $4,420 per kilogram in 2001. As a result of extremely marginal profits, many women have left seaweed farming, but not the poorest of women such as divorcees and widows who do not have any other livelihood alternatives. From my time in Tanzania, I discovered that many young men and boys are joining in the efforts to harvest seaweed as a cash crop because fishing is no longer profitable. These seaweed farmers are marginalized economically and socially, which underscores marginalization and degradation theses even further. In addition to the marginalization of seaweed farmers, there are environmental implications of cash cropping seaweed. Nutrients from seaweed farms could be contributing to algal growth. Due to overfishing and illegal fishing practices, there are less plant-eating fish to graze algae and therefore more macroalgae cover on coral reefs, leaving them susceptible to environmental stressors. When I asked a professor at the Institute for Marine Science in Zanzibar if there could be negative implications of cash cropping seaweed on coral reef ecosystems, he said that there could be, but that seaweed farming is beneficial to women and there are reserved areas to allow buffers to not interrupt ecosystems. What he is claiming to be buffers are segments of the intertidal rocky shore that are beneficial ecosystems with many macro invertebrates and algae important for healthy oceanic ecosystems. These reserved areas um, are granted to, the, granted to women by the government for the use of seaweed farming when the tide is low and they can walk across the shore. 
However, he did admit that if seagrasses are cleared on a massive scale for seaweed farming, definite ecological disturbances such as eutrophication could result. According to another professor at the Institute, the intertidal rocky shores of Tanzania are under stress due to seaweed farming because seaweed farmers trample them when they are walking to their seaweed crops. There are threats of eutrophication and global climate change. One proposed solution to try to protect coral reef environments are marine protected areas, or MPAs. The case study that I chose to analyze is Chumbe Island Coral Park Unlimited. Chumbe is located six kilometers west of the coast of Ngunja, Zanzibar. In the early 1990s, Chumbe Island was identified as a good place for the establishment of a marine protected area because of its coral reef perimeter and because no one previously lived on the island. Chumbe Island Coral Park became the first managed MPA in Tanzania and is considered to be the first privatized MPA in the world. Ecotourism operations began in 1998 with the intention to develop a financially sustainable model of MPA management through revenue generated by ecotourism. I chose Chumbe Island because it's a small scale example of an MPA and it has unique advantages which allow it to be managed without the displacement of communities. My question was whether or not Chumbe could be an example of a conservation success that could potentially be implemented elsewhere. Chumbe Island had a unique advantage when it came to establishing an MPA for many reasons. Some of these reasons are because Chumbe was never inhabited prior to the establishment of the MPA. Fishermen do not typically stray to this area because of its distance from Ngunja. And the MPA is privatized, allowing Chumbe to, be, to enforce regulations themselves through funding made by ecotourism. However, even with these advantages, Chumbe sees increasing amounts of coral reef leaching events, sea level rise, and um, depleting fish stocks due to human environment interactions outside of the MPA. This is a picture that I took of the coral at Chumbe. Um, the black areas shown are sea urchins. A presence of sea urchins can be a positive or negative. Um, can, Chumbe uses sea urchins as a bioindicator of reef health. The presence of sea urchins can be positive or negative depending on the number of urchins present. Too many urchins, like you see in this photo, shows that there are not enough large predatory fish to keep the urchins in check, and the urchins will strip the reef of nutrients needed for the coral to survive. So even with the advantages that Chumbe sees as an MPA, the outside factors continue to degrade the coral reef that is protected. When talking about MPAs more generally, I feel that Robin's environmental conflict and conservation and control thesis are applicable in many cases. I spoke with Justin Raycroft, an anthropologist working um, in Entoara Rural District in southern Tanzania, about an experience he had in which he saw blast fishing occur inside of an MPA in Monzi Bay. Not only did he witness this, but the buildings within the MPA had been blown up due to envir environmental conflict with displaced villager villagers. For many local fishermen, conservation and exclusion from resources have a direct relationship. Environmental conflict is rampant in MPA enforcement due to displacement of people and further marginalization because of inabilities to access resources that they had once relied on for livelihood. While marine protected areas are established with the intentions of being beneficial to all stakeholders, it is often the excluded, marginalized stakeholders that bear the burden of displacement and exclusion from resources and reduced capacity for livelihood activities. At the conclusion of Paul Robbins' book, he states, if political ecology has taught us anything, it's that we can do better than that. We can do better than that. This is a plea and a challenge. From my analysis and interviews, I have found that reform to reduce corruption could conceivably catalyze the reconstruction for more subsistence more secure subsistence livelihoods. While I agree with Robin's sentiment, coming up with a tangible solution for, for conservation of marine environments while also benefiting local communities and economies is an ongoing struggle. This research has opened my eyes to a lot of interesting topics, and I hope to continue to study coral reef conservation and, environment, and human environment interactions in Tanzania after graduation. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Julie. Um, about the blast fishing, did you say that that's um, in Tanzania? That's one of the only places where it's still legal, or it's illegal? It's illegal, but it's uh, still practiced. Um, there isn't really any regulations okay. or punishments for what happens when you get caught. Oh, it was scary. <laughs> I didn't like that. <laughs> Yes. 
Uh, question about the seaweed. Um, places that you seem to indicate that it's the most negative is where it's replacing sea grasses. Mm -hmm. Are there places that you have identified that it might be appropriate as well? Um, no. So kind of going forward, that's one of the research questions that I want to look into. Um, uh, there isn't really much studies done on the implications of or impacts of seaweed farming on coral reef environments. Um, in some cases, they do clear seagrasses um, to make it easier for them to put in the seaweed like farms with the ropes. And also, in many of the areas, they want to keep the beaches pristine, so they clear seagrasses anyways, even if there aren't seaweed farms there, because they don't want tourists to see uh, what they consider to be a dirty beach, which is a beach that's covered in seagrass. Um, but I don't know where seagrass and seaweed harvesting overlap. Anything else? So I'll, I'll make a, a big connective thing. So you've done, there's was a lot of words in a very short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad I have read this because it's like, wow, she covered a lot of ground. So excellent job. Um, and maybe some people are still processing or catching up on some of the things you said. <laughs> And so one of the things that I really like about your project, and, and you know she's done a lot of work about the Philippines as well, because that's one of the other places that has similar um, processes going on, but your overall frame is you're concerned about coral health, and so you were looking at two things that look to be immediately degrading in the areas where they were happening. And the, the interesting thing about Chum Bay is there's not blast fishing, there's not really fishing happening extensively around that area, and there's not seaweed farming hanging or happening around that area, but the downstream effects, if you will, or the, you know, just the, the effects of being part of that same um, larger ecosystem means that even that place is suffering. So could you just talk a little bit about um, the, the coral reef that you saw there that you yourself surveyed? Yeah, um, just, so basically, the way that Chumbe set up, um, let me think about some pictures. So my point, my question being the obvious one, which is even when you're doing yeah. everything right, you can't control. Yeah, so um, basically they explained it to me, if you can see in this top photo, the darker areas are the reef. If you see like out where that, it looks like there might be two boats out there, um, that water is a lot deeper and it's a lot older coral, so they're more resilient, they're less likely to die off in the average coral bleaching event. Whereas the picture that I took is further north where, um, it's a little bit shallower, oh, wrong direction. Um, so like this is probably, I think I might have dove down, dove down a little bit, but I was just snorkeling. So it's a lot shallower and there's branchier corals um, and those will die off easier in a coral bleaching event, but they will um, kind of replenish faster too. Whereas this one over here is a brain coral and it's older and so it's not dead yet, but in, so the top part that's shallower, they're seeing some of these older, like I'm talking like 600 year old coral starting to bleach and die and they won't come back as easy as these branching corals. Um, and so even in Chumbe where they have park rangers and they have people protecting these coral reefs and they're doing everything right and you have to wear a reef safe sunscreen and everything like they're still seeing bleaching events and some of their oldest coral are dying and those won't come back for who knows how long um and basically like once those are gone there won't be any fish species there anymore because th that's the habitat that they they don't want these branching corals they want those older corals um to lay their eggs so yeah and so when there's blasting even a couple yards somewhere else, or I mean a couple miles somewhere else in Ngunja, killing that reef and killing that reef ecosystem means that the, that algae can no longer branch off somewhere else and um, I guess revive the coral at Chumbe. So, and a lot of the things um, I put in this Spot analysis. Um, one of their weaknesses is that their conservation measures are reactionary instead of pro, like proactionary or preventative. Sorry. Um, 
because in a lot of cases they get like alerts that say that there's potentially going to be a coral bleaching event but once like yeah they know that there can be a coral bleaching event but there's nothing they can do about it that's going to happen whether they want it to or not so there's nothing that they can do to stop that at the moment so and then that affects their tourism and their revenue because people don't want to come visit a bleach reef they're not going to want to snorkel there so they're not going to make the funds they need to protect the reef. 